Plains Angels is an initiative of the Greater Des Moines Partnership that connects Iowa-based angel investors with early-stage growth companies throughout the Midwest. Show's yours. I'm J.D. Janizer. I'm a senior partner at Delta WBJ. We work with a great deal of early stage companies. We're an investment bank. We help raise capital, but we also just work with uh, companies getting their forecast put together, the business plans put together. Um, and if you will, I like to use the term getting them on offense versus defense to be able to have a, a, a good sound conversation with an investor. I'm Matt Ostinick. I'm a, um, I'm a global entrepreneur. I started a company of a number of years ago called Civil Exchange and had a uh, software as a service platform for commercial construction projects and I had a chance to build that company, actually raised capital for it a couple times, sold the company in 2011, worked for the acquirer for a couple years, uh, actually went through an IPO as part of their organization and then left there to start another company called Funnelize today as well. So I've got some good experience in uh, raising capital and being through this process myself also. We're going to talk about uh, financials here. I'm actually going to kick it off by sharing a couple stories, though, first, and then JD is going to dig into a little more detail on the financial side. So I, I like stories. They're fun, they're fun to share. And I went through a capital raise for my current company, FunnelWise, um, last year and closed it earlier this year. And I thought I would share a couple of just lessons learned from that experience for you guys as well. So uh, FunnelWise we actually closed a $7 million Series A in January of this year, uh, which is a little bit larger than some of the some of the numbers that I mentioned here earlier. And you know, some of the semantics around this stuff, I agree with 95% of what Tej said up here, but some of the semantics get a little bit flexible about what you call a Series A versus a B versus other things as well. I actually realized as I was putting this slide together, just to give you the context on it, that I forgot an important bullet. So I've got a bullet up here. I did 112 meetings over 14 weeks to raise that money. Actually, the bullet I should have put on there, though, was I spent about, about a year doing high-level planning and about three months of actually pulling all the documents together before that the actual very first meeting as well. So talking about all the prep that goes into it, there was a lot of prep even before sitting down for the very first pitch. But it took 112 meetings over 14 weeks to get verbal commitments for that amount of money. It was a lot of meetings. Uh, and then it took about an additional two months after the ver last verbal commit to actually get all the final paperwork in place and to actually get the funds in hand. So if you do the, um, the full from the prep through the meetings through actually finishing out the paperwork, it was about an eight month process to raise that amount of money as well. And it was 26 total investors that we brought on to raise that particular amount. As I was thinking a little bit about, like, if I had to summarize just some of the key lessons from that that I would share with somebody else who was raising capital, there are really there are four things that come to mind. So the first one, which you've already heard multiple times this morning, but is that it takes a tremendous amount of work, right? It really is a full-time job plus just to raise the capital, which can be a lot of fun if you also have a full-time job to run your business. And for some of you, if you also have another full-time job, which is your day job, uh, which you're working to get out of, so you can focus full time on your business. You can be doing two or three jobs at once to get the capital raising process for sure. Another comment that I would share is that most investing is local, and it was interesting to hear some of the other discussion this morning about, you know, the stats about raising money in Iowa, raising money outside of Iowa, all of that as well. Uh, with my capital raise for FunnelWise, I wanted to have every option possible on the table, so I was aggressively seeking investors in Iowa. And I also was seeking investors all across the country as well. And actually with our company, I have some staff and a small office in downtown Chicago as well. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna hit the Chicago market because there's way more people there with money than there are in Iowa, right? We'll <coughs> at the same time. And my honest experience was that it was really, really difficult to raise money from outside of Iowa. Uh, if you're not, when you're talking to someone in other markets, I found this a lot in Chicago. You know, they're like, you're from where? And why do you guys, why should I care about a startup that effectively is in the middle of nowhere, that's in a place that people don't seem like they really know a lot about startups and technology? Like, that's the general impression you have to overcome. 
Uh, I was not very successful in raising money outside of Iowa. I do have some good investors from outside of Iowa, but definitely it was way harder in my experience than raising money locally or within the state. And what I really found from that was you have to, people are it's going to be easiest to raise money locally where you've got a common geographic connection. If you're trying to raise money from someone who's not local, then you need to have, probably needs to be one of three things. It needs to be somebody who you've got a strong personal history with, so they've got a connection with you. Or they need to have a, a strong or long-term relationship with somebody else who has a relationship with you, and that middle party is really willing to go to bat for you. Like it's not just a casual acquaintance, but it's somebody who's going to go to bat and you're going to testify to how much they believe in you. Or the last category would be uh, if they really believe in and have experience in the space that you're tackling. So whatever tool you're building or product you're offering, if they have some personal history and they believe in that problem, then you sometimes can capture their attention as well. But if you don't have one of those three things, in my experience, it's going to be really tough to raise money from outside of the state as well. The third comment I would make would be, so out of my 26 investors, uh, I've got two people, two outside investors that put in more than a million dollars, greater than a million dollar checks for this particular round. Most of the folks were smaller. My minimum was uh, $50,000. So you had to write a $50,000 check to participate. I could waive that minimum, and I chose to waive that minimum on three specific occasions. So of my 26 people, three of them are less than $50,000. Uh, two of them were relatives to an employee of mine, and I wanted to have some relatives and employees because I thought it would drive the employees to be a little more bought in if they had their family members that had skin in the game on this also. Uh, and the other one was a, a personal connection that in some circumstances where I wanted to have them on the cap table also. And I probably, I probably would have recognized this logically up front, but I definitely saw it after the fact. Like, honestly, the amount of time I spent for those three people that put in like $20,000 each was the same amount of time I put in for people that wrote million dollar checks. Like, it was definitely from an efficiency standpoint in hindsight, it was like, wow, well, I spent as much time for these small folks as I did for the big folks. It's a lot easier to focus on the big folks. Now, with that said, I don't know that many people that can write a million dollar checks. So, you know, if I had a pool of just million dollar check writers, yes, I'd focus all my time there. Ironically, one of the $20,000 checks actually ended up being a real pain and took more time than the million dollar guys. Uh, so good lesson learned that I might, I might have been less, um, less willing to waive my minimum requirements in hindsight now having been through that experience. And then my last general comment I would make is um, you really have to think about it as a long-term game. And you know, today's session here, we're going to talk a lot about, the whole day is going to talk a lot about the technical requirements. So, raising capital and how you do about this, but raising money is a very much an emotional process as well. It's a roller coaster ride, and particularly because you're going to get turned down way more times than you're going to get accepted by somebody. And it's easy to get emotional about that, and particularly when someone turns you down, it's easy to, you know, be irritated about that and talk about how you're never going to talk to that person again or whatever. You really have to think about it as a long-term, a long-term game. And in my experience, some of the best future investors for you will be the people that turn you down initially. So it's important to handle those situations gracefully and frankly to keep those relationships open and even if they turn you down and out, let them know about your progress as you go. You know, think about asking them for it again in the future. And the specific example I'll offer of that, so with my previous company with Submittal Exchange, I had a, a gentleman that turned me down for um, capital at that point. And actually I remember it because he, he had a specific argument with me over my valuation. Like he, we had just had a very different opinions on what the valuation should be for that previous company. And he told me I was completely wrong, my valuation was way too high. And I always kind of remember that conversation, it kind of irritated me. And uh, what's interesting is he always remembered that conversation too, because I ended up having a very successful exit with that previous company and he heard about it. And I didn't realize it, but apparently in his mind he always kind of regretted that he actually didn't put money in on that. And I kind of kept in touch with him and uh, I actually was not going to ask him for capital in this uh, new company around, because I kind of remembered the argument from a few years before. But I had somebody else encourage me to go back to him and ask him again. And it was kind of funny because he, again, strongly remembered the past conversation a couple of years ago. And I was like, yes, absolutely, I'll put in whatever, whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it wasn't quite that easy, but what are your terms? Yes. And actually, ironically, my evaluation for the new company was way higher than the one he had a big issue with uh, last time around. He put in $200,000 on this round. In addition, he then introduced me to other people that combined put in $2 million out of the total round. So the fact that I didn't, you know, kind of kept in touch and, you know, really had that experience a couple years before that was frustrating, he ended up being a great investor for this particular round. So definitely as you go through this, think about it the long-term game, even if they turn you down today, stay in touch with them for the future. Very important as well.
I'm going to turn it over to JD now to really talk more about financials. A couple of lessons learned there as well. He had a very, very successful exit, and obviously that helps the mix side, but he's done a lot of right things through the process, investor relations, et cetera. He said a couple of things I just want to, uh, before I dive in on the cap table financials, is it's very important, even if you're raising a half a million dollars, think about what the minimum threshold should be for investment versus 25,000, 50,000. As Tej said, you know, it, 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 the more investors you have, the more headaches you could possibly have. The other side is I've had people come in and raise a half a million or a million dollars, and they want to let people come in for ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. Well, it is just as difficult closing those investors as it is a fifty thousand. We further to the point I've had people come in and want to invest in a deal. They say I'd be willing to put twenty five in. They say, well, the minimum's fifty. Well, I'll have to get back to you. They come back, write the check. You, you know, you basically doubled up in that process. So it's very, very important to think about the, the totality of the investors you want as well. And then another component isn't part of mine, I'm sure somebody else will get into, is pick the right investors too. I mean, you know, it's 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 it's, it's more than money. You know, it's gotta be people that you know, you're gonna have a relationship with and that you can get along with. One other point with Matt it's just said too is, is what we do pretty well and what I tell clients to do is, is get the no as well. Sometimes a no is just as important as a yes. I, 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 I can't countless times if somebody's been having a hypothetical conversation at 9, 12, 18 months, so-and-so wants to invest, so-and-so. You've got to get on offense, you've got to get the terms in front of them, and or let them know you're actively in this race. And surprisingly, a lot of times, we're a friendly state. People don't want to say no, but sometimes no is very, very important. So. Real quick, Matt, what actually is funnel-wise? Funnel-wise, it's marketing and sales analytics software, actually. Really, it actually addresses a uh, problem that I had in my previous business, which really was getting the types of insights I wanted in my funnel and where my sales organization was having. So it's a great tool that we're this for. We could spend three hours on cap tables and financials, so we're not going we're not going to walk you through scenarios. We're not going to walk you through spreadsheets. We're just going to talk about it. Ted is already Ted is already talked to you a little bit about it. Documentation is um, It's a very very important instrument to have and have it updated all the time. You know. The types of securities have been issued, the rounds of financing, whether you have options, warrants, and obviously the price paid by the stakeholders. Even in your early stage, it's important that if you have multiple shareholders in your position, you that you're scheduling out saying, here's how many shares that are issued and outstanding, here's the ownership structure, and keep it current. You know, it's amazing if you have a current capital, and we, we do this all the time, is it allows you, it's your instrument as well, to run scenarios on pre-money valuations. You can start to play with it and say, what, what if I want to put my pre-money valuation at a million and a half and I go raise 500,000? What's this do to the rest of the shareholders? What if I want to raise it up to a $2 million valuation? What if I want to raise 750,000? It's great at analyzing dilution impact for different size of financing, different pricing. Um, also, it, it, might, it allows you to, to, to look at the opportunity of issuing options, granting options, et cetera. And a current cap table is going to be required during the diligence. They want you to have it basically up to date, current, and an actor. Question. Yeah. Um, did you start keeping a, a cap table in the very beginning? Sure. The family around? Or Absolutely. Point out? Absolutely. Okay. And because it's got to be disclosed anyway, right? And, um, you know, absolutely. So, and it's important, you know, people talk a lot of times about raising money at a price per share. And price per share doesn't mean anything to me. You could have 10 million shares and you can outstanding, you could have 100 shares outstanding, right? So people always come in and say, I want to raise, I want to raise money at a dollar a share. It just doesn't mean anything to me, how many shares are outstanding. So it's very important that if you even have initial, initial friends, family, if you've co-founded something with somebody and, and you just have a gentleman's agreement or whatever, you've got to get that documentation of who owns what. One of the first things that, that anybody's going to ask you, one of the first things I always ask anybody that comes to my office is, can I see your cap table? I want to see who owns you. And it's a little, it's, it's kind of a litmus test, too, to see if you even know or if you have it. And, and so, yes, absolutely, early stage, just keep it. And it, it could just be you, right, initially, and says, so here's how many units, if you're an LLC or shares, if you're a C Corp or an S Corp, but just actually documentation of who owns what in your, in your company. Um, Keep it organized and, and, and have it easily to follow. Sometimes people will put something together and it's just not intuitive and all it does is slow down the investor process. It's just, it's just you, you can just sequence the rounds out. If you're in an A and you've already got a C round and you have a founder's round, just logically lay it out so people can understand who owns what and how they came into the ownership of your company. Um, 
have all the supporting documents to support that too, and have those in good order as well. In other words, to that point, if you have uh, friends and family that own or whatever it is, they, they should have subscription agreements, they should have ownership documents. You should have either your, your, uh, your uh, shareholders agreement or operating agreement if you're an LLC that supports all of it. Hire a good attorney. You know, it's very, very important that initially you begin the process of getting everything documented and everything on the paper. We've, we've assisted many companies on capital raises where we've had to stop, expend energy, resources, and time to go back and get the initial documents paper for who owns what before we can go to market on it, even a C round or a Series A. I don't think I see it. We're going to talk a lot about cap tables. We're going to talk about a lot about rounds, all this kind of stuff throughout the day. But that's just again a little bit of editorial on, on keeping your cap table current and having it well documented and supported. On your financials, the most important thing that probably will come across today is own your financials, own your forecast, know your forecast. Don't get into a room with an investor and say, "Well, I hired somebody and they put this together for me. I'm not sure exactly how this works." Or yeah, we're going to have 500 customers this year, and then we're going to have 1,100 next year, and we're going to have, I just put a percent growth in there or something like that. I mean, know, know the dynamics, know the metrics that are driving your forecast. A lot of times when we initially meet with companies, we, we spend time just trying to understand the metrics that are what, what, what's going to drive. How are you going to sell? If you're, if, you're, if you're focusing on manufacturers, you're focusing on selling into hospital systems, are you going to focus on 500-bed hospitals? Are you going to focus on 1,000-bed hospitals? What geography? What, what percent of doctors are you going to sell in? Are you going to sell at clinic levels? What's the average uh, size of doctors in each of these clinics? And how, how do you sell into them? So you're starting to get layers of knowing who the customers are. And they, again, take the time, develop realistic, detailed forecasts. It's got to be realistic assumptions that you can support. Three to five years is what a lot of people, you know, somebody's already made a comment today that it's just high in the sky, and it, it, it somewhat is. But, Somebody's got to want to be able to extrapolate where you are today, at least to the next 12 to 18 months, because that's the risk. Can if you get this capital in, can you extrapolate where you are today, leverage where you are today, to actually make these numbers work and make it simple? Sorry. Let's just take revenue assumptions. Um, Again, it, it, it's basically grounded in how you're going to get to the customer, who the customer is, what your distribution path is to that customer, and here's how you're going to support it. So it's back to whether it's the, the, the hospital level, the manufacturers, they're making you know 10,000 widgets versus the ones that make only 2,000 widgets today, the ones that sell maybe the auto industry versus this. Whatever that focus is, and knowing that market size, and knowing how you're going to initially enter that marketplace is so, so, so important. It's not. It's, it's, it's just not simple saying, well, there's 10 million of these potential customers out there and we're just going to start to sell them to them. You've got to drive deeper and understand, and then the next point is know who's making the purchase decision and how you get to them. A lot of this stuff has nothing to do with actually making the financial forecast. It's actually understanding and being able to support the financial forecast. Anybody can get on Excel and put numbers in it. It's the ability to be able to articulate, understand, and support those numbers. And then your pricing model. You know, somehow you've got to show there's validation to support your pricing model. It could be it could be the competitive landscape, it could be a disruptive market that you're selling into, you could be at a price point that is supported by other vertical market vertical opportunities within that marketplace. Um, but you can't just say it's seventy nine dollars a month and here's what you know, like you've got to be able to support it and it's got to be proven. You, you you have to know this is this sometimes is even more important than the revenue. What does it cost to serve that customer? And by that I mean, if you're manufacturing something, what does it cost to make it? What is your gross margin? If it's a, if it's a software as a service company, what are your support costs? Maybe it's maybe it's technical support. Maybe it's hosting related services. Maybe it's uh, other IT. Maybe there's shared licensing requirements. But your gross margin is really your revenue deducting. The cost to serve that revenue. Not all your overheads, your rents, and everything. It's just it's simple as if I have if I manufacture this widget, it costs me ten dollars. If I sell it for fifteen, I know I got a five dollar margin there. So it's very very important to know your gross margin and understand your gross margin. Also, your cost to sell. 
by that is, you know, what are the re it could be just, it could be in-house people, it could be resources, it could be people, it could be commissions, it could be, you know, I've got a revenue share with a distributor or, or another uh, vertical integrator into that marketplace. Know your cost to sell the product as well. Operating costs are, are just as important, but I don't necessarily always focus on those initially. It's, you know, again, what else? What's your overhead structure? Some, some components of operating costs are very expensive, maybe insurance, maybe legal costs. Um, there could be other regulatory issues. Um, we work with a lot of companies that have a lot of regulatory issues, and sometimes they can be drowned in that. Um, and then capital expenditures also, with regard to what is it, what, are, what is required to, to grow out your business with regard to infrastructure, equipment, computers, furniture. It could be heavy machinery and equipment that you're going to capitalize to actually manufacture or something. Yeah. The cost of the customer acquisition cost just the cost of sale divided by the number of customers on it? Sure. It, it can be that simple. Exactly. I mean, it, 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 you've got to understand that whatever. I have some companies that actually their customer acquisition costs, it, it could be two, three, four months worth of revenue, right? So then they're, they're able to offset that. Over. So yeah, it could be that. It could be as simple as saying, hey, here's what this here, here's what this customer cost me today, here's that, what that revenue stream is, and you're analyzing the difference of it. I don't know if I'm answering you, but. Yeah, well, that's one of the first questions we always get asked, is what's the customer acquisition cost in the forecast? Yeah, and, but Andy, another point on that, though, is if you have dedicated salespeople, right, and, and, and you have other resources deployed to that, you've got to throw those into that process as well, right? Because they're truly, they're truly costing you as well versus Sometimes people think of customer acquisition costs as outsourcing something or whatever to go get a customer or market to get a specific customer. I'm more global and think about what all what all do you need to acquire that customer? Right. Well, I mean, it's becoming a bigger deal when you move from, for us, on-prem software to subscription software. Exactly. Because how is that tail going to catch up if you can't? Because it's a totally different. But see, then, if when I'm looking at that, then, and Mike wants to say something, when I'm looking at that, then, is most important to me is when I'm analyzing your true customer acquisition costs, I want to know the life cycle of your customer as well, and what that return is, right? right? So, particularly on a software as a service or subscription-based services, to say, look at what my return can be from that. Yeah, yeah I just want to add one thing. When certain people start asking you about your customer acquisition costs, it's relevant to what kind of business you are, all right? So, the scale at which you're selling it, which is a very high purchase price product with a long-term commitment, um, is totally different than I would look over here at Darian and say most of his customers are coming in through online activities that are automated. So the first thing you do is find five or seven comparable companies that are already in the market and find out how they measure customer acquisition cost. All right, they're successful. So Darian might look at Trump Club and say, I wonder how they do it. You might look at some enterprise software provider because the investors are going to look at it relative to similar competitive companies. So just understand that it's such, it sounds simple when somebody says, what's your CAC or what's your customer acquisition cost? But the formulation of how you get there is very, very different if you're selling clothes online, if you're selling telehealth software, if you're selling enterprise software, uh, or you're selling physical machinery. They're all quite different. And you mean because of the recurring revenue from some of those sales? No, just the way the industry works. Not so much just, it could be recurring revenue. I'm just saying the investor looking at your offer is going to want to know your customer acquisition costs and it's going to look at how do you do versus your competition, your uh, similar companies. So they're going to want to look at you in relevance to, in relevance to others. If uh, Ben Lefebvre over there is out raising capital for a telehealth provider, they're going to look at other uh, health services, software pr provision products, they're going to look at other tele telemedicine products, they're not going to look at the way Darian looks at it or the way uh, Andy looks at it. That's what I'm trying to say. Is you have to be relevant to the market and the others that are like you. If I could just add to that, for a second, I totally agree. So the, I tend to talk about it in terms of like the CAC to LTV ratio, which is just the customer acquisition cost to the lifetime value of the customer, and that's that's a huge thing for measuring a healthy business. It's particularly important in software as a service, but it definitely is being applied more and more in other businesses. So in a specific example, would be like in my business, funnel wise, it might is it rounding numbers here, but a customer pays us $20,000 a year for our software. Well, it costs us, our acquisition cost is about $20,000 a customer, right? So when you initially look at that, you say, oh, you're losing money on this customer, you're not making any money because you're spending $20,000 to get them and they're only paying you $20,000. Like, that doesn't make business sense. How does this business make sense? But when you look at the lifetime value, which is we expect our customers to be on board for five to seven years, 
so that customer's worth 500, excuse me, 100 to 140 thousand dollars for us. So five to seven years times 20 thousand dollars a year. That that's actually you know a, a very healthy CAC to LTV ratio, or making more money in the long term. Unsophisticated investors might not understand that, but those that have experience in this, they'll look at those types of metrics to identify, like, do you have a healthy long-term business model? Even if you're going to lose a ton of money in the first few years, that's how they can measure the long-term health. And even companies that are going public today where they're losing tons of money, looking at that, you know, that CAC to LTV story is how you still assess, is this a good business even if it's losing money today, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's drop body this problem. Their customer acquisition cost is positive and their revenue is zero for most of the customers. So there's no horizon where they ever go back to making money because they're not charging people any money. So that's the trap, that's the corner that they paint themselves into. Right. If the, long, if the lifetime value of the customer is less than the acquisition cost, then you right. don't have a good business. That's the so. problem with the freemium thing is you give away things for free and then if you can never get to monetizing those memberships, you're and that's why investors are scared to hell, scared to death, excuse me. Uh, uh, they're just scared to death of these freemium models because so many of them haven't worked. I mean, you can talk about the ones that do work, but sometimes these ones where, you know, the economics just don't work. It's like after a while, we're all going to These aren't working. Stop. Have you been pressured in your most recent uh, business to uh, have a plan for reducing your acquisition costs, or as long as you can show? Look, I'm making something on the lifetime value. It's okay, but are, are, or are you already having to say and I'm going to reduce it? And this is how. Are they asking you for that? Uh, I wouldn't say we've been pressured, but you have to have a plan around it because, frankly, in the early stages, your acquisition costs suck. Right. And you're going to spend, they're going to be terrible if you try to do that ratio in the first year or two because you're going to be investing a ton of time. You're not going to have your sales process figured out. You may be in a longer term sales model in your business. Like our, in our actual uh, CAC to LTV ratio right now is way less than the numbers I just cited. But we have a plan for where we're going to get to the point. So depending on who you're working with, it may or may not be pressure, but you certainly have to show how you're going to improve that over time. And certainly, you know, if you want to sell your business someday, like having that type of ratio in the right place is going to go a long way to making it more attractive. So you've got to have a plan for how you're going to get there over time. And JD, when uh, when a new client comes in, do you help them set up some of these indicators, or would that be something they'd have to ask you? Specifically? No, we do, and you know, we kind of joke that we we lock you in a room until we get it right. <laughs> it's amazing that you go through a process and. It really forces you to think about your business. I mean, building a financial model is really the the, the, the end result is maybe a P and L, but the whole it's all driven on all these assumptions. It's all driven on what, what requirements you need, how you're going to sell, how you're going to price, the cost around all this. But then further, the point is is what your traction rates can be in your business. So you've got to have it all ground. Right? So it's interesting because a lot of stuff we're talking about has nothing to do with the financial statement. Talking about all the metrics and being able to understand your business is all. The, I have several clients we help institute, and we, we, we do it in my office. Even is even we call it a flash report in my office. But what are you, are you watching your metrics? The, the key metrics, everything can drive to the bottom line. What, what's what's important today to accomplish? What was important this week to accomplish? What are those key metrics? Are all fall to your financial statements generally? So it is just yeah, it's just building all those components and further understanding all these components. You know, Matt gave a great example on that metric, and it's. It, it really has nothing to do with a financial statement, but in a way it has everything to do with a financial statement. So, so yes. Um, and we'll ask any, any other questions we'll answer. Uh, the, the next piece is, is truly, it's not a balance sheet, it's not a P&L either, it's your cash flow forecast. And you really have to manage your inputs and outputs of cash, just pure cash. And so, I mean, it's, it, it could be as simple as you just start a snake chain and say, hey, here's, Here's this month's beginning cash. I got to pay rent. I got to pay, you know, the salaries out. I got to do this. I got to do this, this, this. Here's my ending cash. At some point, you hope I've got cash receipts coming in from customers, and you know, some could be more complex because your your, your receivable turn could be 60, 90 days, could be 30 days. It could be monthly reoccurring revenues where you start to know, hey, I'm getting this about each month. But good operators know their cash flows, and it's very, very important. You know, people ask what your burn rate is. Which people don't understand what your burn rate is. They think it's well, how much you can lose this. Month. Really, you know, how much cash are you truly burning through? Um, uh, you know, on a monthly, quarterly basis, whatever that is. Um, spend wisely and be thrifty. We've, you know, obviously talked about that. I mean, it's, 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 you know, 
someone coming in and trying to raise a half a million dollars that's taking two hundred thousand dollars salary out they want to take a two hundred thousand dollars salary I'm, we're not the right people to help them most of the time any investors in this room is not your right investor either um, and so it's just really making sure that people are going to write you a check they want you to be prudent with put those funds right so a cash flow is just really that as well you understand the, you understand the ins and outs it'll evolve obviously but initially it could be you know a stub period where you're getting ready to go to market manage that have that laid out and, and it'll it'll it will adapt but it can be as simple as just a simple excel spreadsheet your monthly ins and outs of true cash um, we talked about finding creative ways to bring on resources or delay hiring i mean i think chris talked about equity versus cash and all that we you know there are there, there are some pitfalls in that as well there might be some creative ways to do that or you get some advisors that'll, that'll step in and you know, I'll help you and maybe guide you through some things. My call though is probably the best resource in the Midwest um, to, to actually bounce, bounce ideas off of and mentor you. Um, you know, there might be ways to reduce salaries, but the, the, the most important thing is always have it and uh, at least 60 days to manage to your cash. People want to understand that. That was very quick. So, um, please. So, JD did a great job of summarizing a lot of the considerations there. Maybe, maybe two things I would add to his comments. One would be another document that I've put together in the past with my own use, although I haven't shared it with investors, but it's actually kind of a, a cap table forecast, as I would call it, which is more a projection, which is not just, you know, a straight cap table is who you've got in as investors already, but a, a projection or a forecast would be what you expect your cap table to look like three or five or ten years down the road as well. So based on when you think you're going to need to raise more money and what the valuation might be at those points, which ties back to your other financials since it probably relates to your revenue growth, for me it's always helpful to plan out where I want that cap table to be at further down the road. And I do that because I want to know what sort of returns I might be able to deliver for investors in the best case scenario and also what the worst case scenario in theory could look like as well. That's, it gets a little bit complicated. Uh, and again, that's more of an internal working document, but I find that helpful to forecast the cap table in the future for multiple years as well. The, um, the other thing I was going to add was on the, for on the forecasting piece and the cash flow statements, I 100%, 110% agree with everything JD said about them. You have to master them. They're still going to be wrong in my experience. So even though you have to master them and know them inside and out and have a basic reality, they're still going to end up being wrong. And I'd be curious what other folks would say on this, but if you were, you know, if you were pitching me to invest in your business, one of the things I would look at is one I would test to make sure that you've actually got those things mastered and you've really put them together the way that they has said. But then I would also think in my mind, I would think, okay, so what if they only hit half of the forecast and what if it takes them twice as long to do it? Is this still a good investment or not? Like that's the mental gut check I would do to decide if I was really interested in investing in your business or not. And other people really have other rules of thumb they apply to it, but I think it's important to keep that type of stuff in mind. So you have to master it, it has to be great, it's still gonna be wrong, and even if it's wildly wrong, is it still a good investment for people or not? So would you guys then recommend having a um, variety of options within your you know, best case, worst case? I, I think you, I would be curious how JD would answer that. My initial reaction is you have to be careful what you show people I think some of this is just for your own planning on it to understand how people are going to look at it. How would you answer that? Yeah, I, I have nothing wrong with having a reach budget and a forecasting budget, but the minute you start to give me good, better, best as an investor, I, you know, you, you know, again, Matt's right. I mean, it's going to be wrong, but you know, you're going to pivot. Things are going to change, but it's really more the whole test and analyzing the financial statements and your the metrics that are driving is that you understand what you're trying to do, right? So I, I'm not a big proponent. I, I, internally, it's great, Steve. So it's sort of baked in anyway for a normal forecast. It's baked in that it's going to be most likely on the lower side of. What well, and into that point, we call it stress testing as well. You know, somebody will come in and say they're going to they're going to get X percent of a market or do something like this or however they're going to get into to, to whatever the whatever they're selling into, and we'll do the same thing with regard to it because a lot of times your 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 infrastructure costs and stuff can't change dramatically, and if you're really dependent on getting these certain revenue metrics in there. Um, People will, to Matt's point, say, "What if you don't hit these targets? What if you hit a third of these targets? What happens here, here, here?" You know, some of the variable costs would obviously come down, but sometimes you still got the, 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 you know, the overhead burn and all that. And so people will, people, people will, you know, as simple as cutting it in half and saying, "What if you only hit half?" But, um, but no, I'm not a big proponent in arrays and in documents um, of having multiple forecasts. 
but I have no issues with you internally pushing your team to say, hey, we can do this. Here's where here's where our expectations are. We're gonna we're gonna manage to this one. We got at least at that one. Yeah, the multiple forecasts could dilute your message when you're pitching to investors. Mm -hmm. And then I, when you were doing it to me, I'd always, I just picked the worst one, and then I would cut, then I would cut that in half. So it's probably better to present one. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I know the lot more. Just in their chairs. We're gonna have plenty of time for questions afterwards. Let's take a break. Let's come back at ten thirty, and we will do more. Q &A.